invite our chairperson, Dr. Shashan Akirkar uh, from Mumbai. Please come on, guys. And Dr. Mali from Puducherry. Please come here. Our first session on spondyl arthritis grand rounds, which is given by Dr. Agra Chaudhary from Kolkata. Please come on, please. Followed by final verdict and expert uh, comment by Dr. Shashank sir. Spondyl arthritis update uh, on signature of molecular mechanism in reactive arthritis by Dr. Jyoti uh, Parida from Bhubaneswar. Please come on, direct sir. And the last session on NSAID is NSAID is the only choice for patient with pure axial spondylar arthritis in research limited setup by Dr. Jyoti Srikant from Kochi. Please come, ma'am. Presenting the SPA grand rounds. So, there is a post run session. I, I hope I am able to hold your attention till the end. So, I will start off with a case. This is a 32 year old gentleman admitted with low back pain for 5 years, which increased for 2 months. He had no symptoms to suggest a spondyloarthritis and he had no fever, loss of weight, or any other constitutional symptoms. His inflammatory markers were uh, markedly elevated. HLA V27 by PCR was negative and we did an MRI of the SI joint which showed fatty changes and erosions but no bone marrow edema so it was not fully conclusive of a spondyloarthritis. So this is the MRI image as you can see the star image shows a hyper intensity in, at multiple levels and this is a T1 post contrast image which shows that contrast enhancement at multiple levels at the same uh, site where the star hyper intensities are there. So now, uh, the question that comes to our mind, so is this a spondyloarthritis or are we dealing with a case of infective spondylodiscitis? So uh, this is not a routine case but we do come across such cases once in a while in our day to day clinic. So <coughs> we need to be well aware of the spine changes in spondyloarthritis. Now as rheumatologists, when a patient comes to us with low back pain, we tend to uh, order for MRI of the sacroiliac joint. Uh, we do not routinely order an MRI of the spine, however some centers does protocol based MRI of the spine also, the few sections. But many a times it happens that patient would have visited an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon who would have ordered an MRI of the spine and uh, they come with these changes. So sometimes these changes will be confused with infective changes. So we need to be uh, aware of the what all the spinal MRI in spondyloarthropathy, what are the features. So any talk with the MRI starts with understanding the sequence of the MRI because that is the most difficult thing. So most commonly we see T1 sections, third sections and T2 sections. So T1 section, there are three things to be seen in any MRI film. It is the disc, the spinal fluid and the subcutaneous fat. So, if you see the in T1 section, the disc is hypo intense. In T2 and stud, uh, the disc is very much hyper intense. The spinal fluid is hyper intense. And if you see the subcutaneous fat in T1, you can see the bright subcutaneous fat, whereas in stud sequence, the subcutaneous fat is suppressed. So, what are the spinal changes in spondyloarthritis? So, they are broadly classified as inflammatory changes and structural changes. Again, inflammatory changes uh, can be classified as changes which in, uh, involve the vertebral body and changes which does not involve the vertebral body. The vertebral body inflammatory lesions uh, can be uh, the vertebral corner inflammatory lesions, also called as anterior or the posterior spondylitis, end plate inflammatory lesion, also called as aseptic spondyloviscitis, and uh, lateral inflammatory lesions, which are only seen in the thoracic spine. We shall all see the pictures of this and there can be lesions which does not involve the vertebral body namely the facet joint in, uh, inflammatory lesion and posterior element inflammatory lesions. So let's see. So here we can see the changes of anterior spondylitis. Remember when we see, uh, talk of inflammatory changes we have to see the stir images and we can see the stir images the <coughs> spinal uh, fluid is bright the disc is bright. So these are areas of anterior spondylitis and this is a massive area of spondylodiscitis. <coughs> so another lesion, these are the lateral inflammatory lesions. 
So if you see the structure of the ribs and the spine, these are the, the, the ribs in articulates with the main uh, body of the vertebra by the costovertebral joint and they also articulate at the costotransverse joint. So sometimes if you see from a lateral view, the inflammation can spread from the body of the vertebra uh, to the ribs and to the pedicle creating an arcuate shaped lesion. So if you see the stir images, you can see this uh, arcuate or former shaped lesion which are called lateral inflammatory lesion and which also involves the facet joints and as well as the costotransverse and the costovertebral mm -hmm. joints. Now whenever a neurologist or a neurosurgeon orders for an MRI spine, the radiologist also tends to see only the spinal cord. But if we are ordering the MRI of the spine, we need to specifically mention that please look at the lateral elements, otherwise many diagnoses will be missed. So again, these are the stud section shows anti areas of anterior spondylitis. So <coughs> this uh, again shows areas of anterior spondylitis, former shaped lateral inflammatory lesions, and these are former shaped lateral inflammatory lesions with uh, facet joint lesions. Now coming to the structural changes, this can be of four kinds: bone erosion, focal fatty lesions, bony spur, and ankylosis. Again, bone erosion can involve the corners which are called corner bone erosion or non-corner bone erosion. Bony spur can be again corner spur or non-corner spur. And ankylosis can be vertebral corner ankylosis, end plate ankylosis or facet joint ankylosis. So let's see the pictures. So these are areas of uh, bony spur formation and this is a ankylosis which goes through and through the disc. So this is a uh, ankylosis within the intervertebral disc. So if you are, if uh, MRI is not a very good uh, imaging mode of uh, imaging to see for the syndesmophyte or bony spur, CT is a much better imaging. But again, MRI can show these changes. So again, this is a lesion uh, which is showing hyperintensity T1 hyperintensity. Similarly, I mean uh, when we see stir hyperintensity indicates inflammatory lesion but a T1 hyperintensity indicates fatty replacement so we have to very, be very uh, careful about identifying which sequence are we dealing with so here we can see fatty changes and the anterior and posterior vertebral corners so here are the uh, erosions so this is a erosion involving the corner and this is a non-corner bone erosion this is a T1 image showing the hypo intensities and in the same area in the stud section there are my areas of bone marrow edema around these areas of erosion so there are both uh, activities there as well as uh, structural changes are there so again in this image you can show uh, see multiple areas of fatty change so this is a very nasty looking MRI um, there are huge amount of corner bone erosion ankylosis as well as bony spur formation so <coughs> coming back to our in index case so, it was a case of Anderson lesion or aseptic spondylodiscitis. So, its prevalence varies between 1.5 to 2.8 percent, mainly seen in the thoracolumbar junction. So, this is hemispheric shaped hyperintensity, mainly seen in the stress section, and it is very often confused with the infectious discopathy. So, <coughs> going back to the image, see the stress section. This is a stir hyperintensity, which is hemisphere shape and um, which is again uh, uh, enhanced on the T1 post contrast images but there is no collection uh, or soft tissue <coughs> enhancement which suggests that this is not, most likely not a infective spondylar discitis but again <coughs> telling this is uh, not very easy task many a times we end up doing a biopsy from the area before concluding that it is a case of uh, it is not a case of infective spondylar discitis so what are the differentials so mainly bacterial or uh, bacterial spondylodiscitis, tubercular spondylodiscitis, type 1 modic change, Schmoltz snort or once in a while you will see Schwermann's typhosis. So infective spondylodiscitis when to suspect? When the patient comes with new or worsening of back pain and fever, intravenous access or hemodialysis, a recent infection like a bacteria or endocarditis, diabetes and new neurologic deficits. So what are the differences between a pyogenic and a tubercular spondylitis? So patients with pyogenic spondylitis are older. The, it is a mostly an acute onset uh, event. This is a history of recent history of a bacterial infection and frequently associated with high fever and acute sepsis. The patient is very toxic looking. And ESR, CRP uh, are markedly elevated. Total counts may be usually elevated. 
in comparison tubercular spondylitis patients can are relatively young they can be uh, they can have a back pain for uh, 6 months to even a one year it is a subacute onset with very low grade fever other constitutional features like weight loss of may be there and ESR CRP may be just mildly increased so what are the clues that we can, uh, should suspect uh, that this is a case of tubercular spondylitis so uh, spread under the anterior longitudinal ligament skip lesions so one thoracic spinal lesion and then the lesion involves the lumbar spine whole vertebral body can be involved there can be paraspinal collections calcification sparing of disc so if you see this image this is a thoracic spine which shows that the disc height is preserved there are lesions in the vertebral body and the in the same patient the lumbar spine shows a skip lesion so multiple level lesions may be seen again here you can see the uh, inflammation is spreading under the anterior longitudinal ligament there is a collection same thing here under the anterior longitudinal ligament so what are the MRI points to distinguish between these two so the number of vertebral bodies involved in a pyogenic spondylitis is limited less than two vertebral bodies are involved whereas in tubercular it is a multi-level involvement destruction of vertebral bodies is there uh, because it is an acute process it is a mild to moderate destruction whereas in case of tubercular spondylitis it is a chronic process and it is more severe destruction in pyogenic there is um, disc destruction whereas in tubercular many a times we see that the disc height is preserved the areas of paraspinal enhancement is a poorly demarcated contrast whereas in TB it is well demarcated <coughs> So vertebral enhancement is homogeneous in pyogenic and tubercular it is heterogeneous and both of the th uh, things are associated with abscess formation. So let's see the images. So this is a case of tubercular spondylitis. You can see that there is a connection and this is a case of, case of uh, pyogenic spondylitis. Here also there is intense, uh, intense contrast enhancement and there is a huge collection and it is just involves two vertebra so infective versus non-infective the distinguishing is not very easy especially in the early cases but uh, generally an ankylosing spondylitis only one lesion is not seen there will be other areas of involvement and uh, SI joint MRI may be helpful in such a case and soft tissue edema or uh, paravertebral abscess are not seen in spondyloarthritis now another case a 25 year old male who presented with a pain in the dorsal spine for 5 years no nocturnal pain or early morning stiffness uh, inflammatory markers are normal HLA between 7 negative and his mother has rheumatoid arthritis so uh, this is the MRI section so what we can see in the stern sections or even in the T1 vertebral section that there is collapse of the vertebra now this is a 25 year old gentleman and there is no obvious lesion to uh, which can cause this collapse and this is a T1 post contrast image which does not show any contrast enhancement anywhere in the vertebra now we uh, as rheumatologists sometimes think that this may be ankylosing spondylitis because the lesion involves the dorsal spine but this is not the case so this is a case of Schuermann's kyphosis so <coughs> Schuermann's kyphosis is a form of a rigid ky spinal kyphosis caused by anterior wedging more than 5 degree across 3 consecutive vertebra it is the most common cause of structural uh, kyphosis in adolescents so young boy uh, mainly between 10 to 20 or at the max 20 to 30 presenting with kyphosis we should uh, suspect Schwerman's kyphosis and typical age is 10 to 12 years it can be uh, thoracic or thoracolumbar thoracic is the most common form and associated with better prognosis uh, symptoms may be just a pain or uh, kyphotic deformity so MRI feature shows anterior wedging across three consecutive vertebra more than five degree and other degenerative changes may be seen so the other uh, common um, thing that we uh, that comes into a differential diagnosis is small snort so small snort corresponds to the herniation of the nucleus material through the end plate of the vertebral bodies into the subchondral bone so this is this is a very frequent finding in degeneratives uh, uh, in patients with uh, mechanical back pain. So this is a small note. So this can sometimes be confused with the uh, changes of spondyloarthritis. So here you can see these are small nodes. So these are not erosion. This is small node. 
So the last one that I like to discuss is modic changes. So this is also a part of degenerative spine changes. It is of three types, um, but the type one modic change may be confused with spondyloarthritis. The type one shows a decreased signal intensity on T1 weighted image and increased signal intensity on T2 weighted image. So these areas may be confused sometimes with the areas of uh, anterior spondylitis changes. So now the main question lies that can a spinal inflammation occur without a SI joint inflammation? So this was a paper that I found. It was done in patients with non-radiographic SPA as part of the ability trial for adalimumab. So what uh, by Van der Heijs and group. So it was found that among patients with active non-radiographic SPA as defined by Basdai and the total pain scores, the spinal uh, inflammation on MRI may be observed in as much as half of those without MRI evidence of SI joint inflammation. Now this disease population was a long standing case. So for what they concluded that further studies are needed to see that whether the same changes are seen in um, disease with a short duration. So, summarizing, spinal changes in MRI can help us in diagnosis of spondyloarthritis when the classic changes in SI joint are not seen. Sometimes these may be confused with infections and other degenerative changes and presence of a soft tissue edema or an abscess is an important differentiating feature. Thank you all. Thank you, Abra, for that uh, in-depth talk. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, when we rely mainly on the MRI for our final diagnosis, young patient, backache, and you know, there is nothing else, no other clue to a diagnosis, and we heavily depend on MRI to give us a final diagnosis. That is where uh, we need to really, you know, have a lot of discretion uh, when it comes to, you know, base, uh, basing our diagnosis only on that. Uh, why am I saying that? If we go by uh, the recent trials, almost 20 to 25 percent of normal population can show sacroiliitis if we jo go just by the ASAS criteria for diagnosis of uh, sacroiliitis on MRI, not the clinical criteria, just the radiological criteria. Postpartum ladies, if you look at almost 25, there are quite a few studies that have shown that 25 percent of asymptomatic postpartum ladies can be diagnosed with sacroiliitis if we go just by the ASAS radiological diagnosis criteria and more than 50% of postpartum ladies if they have backache can be diagnosed uh, when it comes to you know just applying the ASAS sacroiliitis criteria. 30 to 35% of recreational lung runners and 41% of hockey skaters as per uh, some of the studies have been shown uh, they can meet the criteria the ASAS radiological criteria for sacroiliitis even when they are asymptomatic. So that, that really you know gets us to a question as to how much should we depend should the diagnosis of early non-radiographic AXPA should be equated to just two bone marrow edema lesions on a single slice or one lesion on two consecutive slices. So we really need to apply our mind and discretion there. Though uh, we always say that classification criteria are not really meant for diagnosis. But in these early cases, we really need to keep in mind the entry criteria of backache, young patient and at least of 3 months duration. And lastly, as Abra has rightly pointed out, it's not just the sacroiliac joint. We definitely should look at the spine, should look at the active lesions, chronic lesions before we really reach a diagnosis in a young patient who, in whom we are looking at early expert. Thank you very much. Now next up on spinal arthritis update on signature of molecular mechanism in reactive arthritis by Dr. Jyoti sir. So good afternoon. First of all, thanks to the organizing committee and IRA for uh, giving us this chance to discuss uh, about reactive arthritis, which is a very, very uh, less discussed topic in these meetings. So my topic is uh, what are the signature of molecular mechanisms? And I think 200 years back, the first signature comes the triad, that is conjunctivitis, urethritis, and arthritis. 
But after that, it was uh, known as reactor syndrome, and then because of the Nazi background, now it is again called as reactive arthritis. And this is the official signature or the criteria uh, which was decided in 1999, almost 20 years back. And other than the major criteria were asymmetric oligoarthritis involving lower limb, uh, that was one major criteria having a preceding infection history, either that is the enteritis or diarrhea or urethritis. Plus, you should have evidence for the triggering infection or evidence of persistent synovial infection with chlamydia. So, definitely reactive arthritis is if you have both major criteria plus one of the minor criteria. If it is not there, then it is a probable reactive arthritis. But there are many criticisms. The most important is more than 50% in our clinical practice, they don't give any history of infection. It is very difficult to document infection because by the time patient develops arthritis, already the infection is gone. And there are lack of facilities for this PCR, doing stool culture, everything at a primary and secondary care level. And one of the uh, suggestions that you can use IgA for enter, uh, this enteric bacteria, but in a country like India, I think in our community these bacteria are so uh, frequent that we cannot really depend on them. And again, this criteria is only limited to very few classical uh, organisms, whereas recently we are adding more organisms to the list. And very peculiarly, this criteria has not included any genetic like HLA-B27 or any of these typical SKA features or extra features. And the most tragedy is still we are depending on SCR and ULAR to give us a uh, good classification criteria, but nowadays they are not seeing more of reactive arthritis though. Because previously they were seeing mainly chlamydia reactive arthritis. Because of more aggressive treatment of STD and more awareness, now the reactive arthritis there it is decreasing. So it is, we have to uh, set up the tone and uh, search for a new criteria. And should we expand the horizon of reactive arthritis? Because previously whatever, whatever we are called undifferentiated spondyl arthritis because there was no infection history. Now people have already demonstrated that their synovial fluid T cells also proliferate in response to salmonella out of membrane protein. Same thing with GIA ERA because those people we used to call a GIA ERA, uh, one study from SDPJ has shown that 14 out of 24 uh, people who are having peripheral arthritis, their synovial mononuclear cells, they are also proliferating in response to lysates of enteric bacteria. And is the signature changing over time? This is a paper from France where they have compared, they have taken a cohort from 2002 to 2012 and compared a historical cohort. They have seen that the incidence of chlamydia trachomatis is decreasing. Why I have already told you the reason, more awareness, more treatment. And nowadays people are requiring more DMRD and even anti tna biologicals of reactive arthritis which was not the case earlier and more progression to chronic SPA and less recovery. So that is the signature is changing and the list of microbes are expanding because these are the classic candidates but now if anybody will uh, ask you to remember all the bacteria causing uh, this reactive arthritis, this is not uh, possible to remember. The most uh, recent key on the block is post-COVID reactive arthritis. Uh, there is a paper uh, from our colleagues from uh, Kolkata uh, where they have shown that around 23 patients they have found after COVID, uh, they have documented that lower limb predominant oligoarticular asymmetrical arthritis, like a typical reactive arthritis. They are the most common predominant uh, uh, finding. With a female preponderance, uh, like uh, in reactive arthritis, usually we see more male patients, and the mean joints were around 2.8, axial, all other things they have seen, and most responded to inside and intraarticular steroid. So this is the difference uh, between classical reactive arthritis and uh, post-COVID reactive arthritis. That here we see usually multiple phenotypes like rheumatoid like some patients present with polyarthritis, symmetrical polyarthritis involving small joints, uh, axial SPA like with inflammatory back pain, reactive arthritis like and many can present only with a small joint arthritis, monoarthritis like a MCP arthritis or a PIP arthritis. And still now, most of us, uh, I think, depend on this clinical signature. Any young boy coming to our OPD with a very uh, swollen knee or swollen ankle, we usually uh, diagnose them as reactive arthritis. And many a time, our orthopedic colleague, uh, they just do a synovial biopsy or a big incision uh, to prove that this is not infected. So we need a signature because the clinical features are not variable, uh, are very variable. There is no defining autoantibodies like rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, radiology is not of uh, much help like average zone, but reactive arthritis, the acute uh, subacute arthritis, radiology is not much of help. So we have to look at the pathogenesis to look for an insight, uh, what is happening because 
you can find the bacteria because the time has gone by the time patient has developed arthritis. So this is the classic uh, triad uh, that uh, the genetic signature, we have to look at the environmental signature and we have to look at the what is the host response of cytokine level. So looking for a genetic signature, since long we know that HLA B27 is the main gene which is found in 50 to 80 percent uh, patient and although that is not very important for diagnosis but this has a prognostic marker. Uh, patients with HLA B27, they are more severe, they are more chronic and they are found to have more extra features like skin. Uh, 03 subtype as known to uh, associated with typical clinical triad of reactive arthritis and HLA B27 misfolding has been a major, uh, a major uh, factor why the salmonella uh, or intracellular organism persists within the cell without getting clearance and how they uh, initiate this immune response. And there is also molecular mimicry similarity between the amino acid sequence of HLA-B27 and Yersinia and Sigella. So that's why there is cross reactivity and tolerance uh, by the immune system uh, to these organisms and that's how they persist. So these are the three classic uh, hypotheses. Uh, the role of HLA-B27 uh, in general in uh, spondyloarthritis, also in reactive arthritis. The arthritogenic peptide theory tells us that uh, once these peptides presented by HLA-B27, some of them can have a uh, molecular mimicry with the cell peptides, so that's why they escape the immune surveillance. Hetero homodimer that HLA-B27 can form homodimers and they can excite, uh, they can uh, actually trigger the cells and this homodimer theory actually came because there is a very interesting story when they have tried to see the cyanobacterial fluid and isolate CD8 T cells uh, to clone that they have found actually uh, the opposite is true there are lots of CD4 T cells there in the cyanobacterial fluid and to explain that they have found that if uh, uh, the presentation is through HLA B27 homodimer then it excites the CD4 T cells and the last one is uh, the HLA B27 misfolding theory that whenever you have uh, this, uh, uh, this salmonella and uh, this chlamydia, they are inside the cell, the HLA-B27, because it's a long molecule, this misfolds or this folds over itself, this cannot present these organisms correctly, but so many, these misfolding proteins are generated, they create a ER stress response, so there is so much of stress in the endoplasmic reticulum, which lead to uh, production of IL-23 and there is a TH17 response. So we have done this study of uh, genetic analysis of HLA B27 subtypes uh, and there are more than 100 subtypes. Uh, some are associated with the ankylosing spondylitis and some are not associated. Whatever we have found uh, in a cohort of North Indian uh, patients that HLA B27 05 is the most prevalent one. Although now it's very early to tell what is their uh, significance. And next is uh, microorganisms. We know that reactive arthritis has a very special role that although this presents as septic arthritis, this is sterile arthritis and people are not able to culture the organism although you have demonstrated the antigens and after the primary invasion uh, to either through the gut or through the uh, GI tract uh, then uh, because of uh, there is uh, the, they evade the immune response and then they are carried either by the monocytes or by the small vesicles which are called pathogenic transporters or exosomes to the joint and once these antigens of this bacteria either in full or uh, their uh, part of the bacteria reaches the uh, joint there either you have a bacterial elimination or they have systems to evade your immune system the bacterial persistence which lead to synovitis. People have tried to look uh, what are the bacterial signature inside the joint in reactive arthritis only they are able to show intact bacterium of chlamydia trachomatis but all other bacteria they are only able to show either the DNA or the antigen. The most interesting is in Yersinia and Salmonella they have found the lipopolysaccharide of the membrane to persist for around 4 years or 2 years. This is again a study from SCPGI where they have demonstrated the Salmonella antigen uh, which is the green color one and uh, they have uh, stained that with anti-Salmonella antibody the Sinovel cells and they have found this. And this is a very very old paper showing the persistent bodies or elementary bodies of chlamydia in the joints. The recent interest is actually a move, has moved from the uh, classic bacteria to microbiome and we know that uh, in a, whenever a healthy individual is there, there is uh, immune tolerance to the microbiome but if you have HLA-B27, there is immune response against this microbiome and you will develop inflammation, there is dysbiosis. This is a recent paper uh, from 
uh, Guatemala, that is a part of Central America, where they have shown that this is the only microwave a paper actually. There is a huge scope of research in this area because this is the only paper who have shown that there is more prevalence of aeruinia and pseudomonas uh, in reactive arthritis. And this, interestingly, this aeruinia has more than 97 percent similarity with our classic gut bacteria. And controls are more risk with uh, normal commensals. And if you see this cladograph, uh, they, they belong to different families. Microbiota detect clinical feature. They have shown that patients having a ultrasonic, ultrasonic uh, evidence of uh, this is suggests more of capillavector. Patient who has more sacroiliitis, they have more of this dialister and uh, ruminococcus. And patient who have uveitis has more erwinia and dialister. HLA A24, because in Guatemala, Actually, the uh, prevalence of HLA between is very, very less, and rather HLA A24 is associated with uh, this disease. Around more than 40 percent of reactive arthritis they have found with this HLA A24, and they have seen that HLA A24 with or without disease also predicts uh, some um, some kind of uh, typical microbial combinations. And you can see this uh, cluster analysis where you can see that these blue dots of circles. If these three uh, microbial organisms are there in the microbiome, that detects that this patient is negative for HLA-B27. If the red one is there, then that is suggesting that uh, this is positive. So the uh, take-home message is host genetics also appears a role in uh, defining your microbial flora and that decides that which disease you are going to take up. And this is the host reaction. And why reactive arthritis is different from rheumatoid arthritis because this present with really big swollen joint and acutely inflamed joint and it is full of cytokines. So this is a stage of immune inflammation, the ESRCRP are very high. And these cytokines in the joint and blood are time dependent, that is what I call as time kinetics of cytokines in reactive arthritis. In the initial phase you are more uh, expected to find uh, interferon gamma and IL-17, TH1 and TH17 type of cytokines. But in the chronic phase, you are more likely to expect more TNF uh, as they are released by the activated fibroblasts, osteoblasts, osteoblasts, etc. So these are the cytokine signature work in reactive arthritis and already uh, Dr. Misra and his group have shown that TH17 cytokines are more prevalent. Previous papers have shown that TH1 cytokine and interferons are more prevalent. People are now not looking at cytokines, they are looking at antigen specific T cells in the synovium. So against uh, some of these uh, classical uh, bacteria and uh, more work has been done by Dr. Misra uh, and his group and where he, they have demonstrated that salmonella outer membrane uh, antigen specific T cells both in recombinant and natural uh, antigens they are expanded in the salivary fluid and they also stimulate the monocytes to produce more IL-6 and IL-17. This is again one of our study where we have used multiplex cytokine uh, bid assays where 27 cytokines can be immediately uh, can be studied at a, a single go and what we have uh, seen is surprisingly the serum contains only TNF and IL-12 it doesn't contain any interferon gamma or IL-17 whereas the uh, synovial fluid they contain only IL-17 and interferon gamma uh, the reactive arthritis and undifferentiated spondylar arthritis they are same and they share, share same serum and synovial fluid cytokines the most interesting part uh, to the last that uh, how to link inflammation with metabolites. This is what is metabolomics and this is coming in a big way that uh, you can take salivary fluid from reactive arthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis and you do a NMR spectroscopy and you like, uh, you uh, arrange books in a library, you arrange the metabolites uh, into different profiles and you can see that uh, and this is very cost effective than your genetic studies uh, and this can lead to a metabolic fingerprint. So this is the metabolic signature of reactive arthritis. You can see the green uh, green square. Uh, they are actually uh, separate of reactive arthritis. The red one is rheumatoid arthritis, and the purple one are red. So they are segregated into different groups. And in ROC curve also, they have very good discriminatory factor to tell you that if you are just looking at the metabolics, that this patient must be having rheumatoid or reactive. Uh, again, uh, our, this confirmed our belief that reactive arthritis and USPA they have same metabolites. And uh, again, another study to tell that they can differentiate reactive from rheumatoid. This is the most uh, recent and interesting study that it can measure the oxidative stress. Uh, in the, what happens under oxidative stress, the phenylephrine cannot get converted to tyrosine. So once there is more oxidative stress in bone and sepsis, 
there is more uh, increased phenyl epine to tyrosine ratio and this same has been found in reactive arthritis but these levels are uh, almost normal in rheumatoid and osteoarthritis so that's how this tells us that reactive arthritis is so close to septic arthritis than the rheumatoid or than osteoarthritis so take home message is uh, the signature of new era reactive arthritis is changing Less genital urinary, maybe because of more awareness of STD and aggressive treatment of STD, uh, and more uh, gastrointestinal infection, maybe because of the diagnostic tools are getting identified. And whatever we previously called as undifferentiated spondyloarthritis, they may relate to because they didn't have any infection history. And some of these AIER patients also, they may be nothing but reactive arthritis. Newer terms like post COVID reactive arthritis, I think more data is needed and that have its validation. Got microbiota dysbiosis play a significant role and as we have seen already in one study, it can detect your clinical feature that which patient will develop UITs, sacroiliitis and etc. HLA beetles and subtypes may point towards a genetic signature and at the last metabolomics has the potential to find a signature difference uh, between these closely mimicking groups. Although this has been done for rheumatoid and osteoarthritis differentiation. They are very clinically very evident to differentiate, but most important information will come if you can diagnose and differentiate from septic arthritis to this uh, crystal induced arthritis to reactive arthritis, or they are the actual uh, presenting arthritis. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for such an informative talk. Uh, followed by this, there is a most controversial talk, at least in our country, that is NSAID is the only choice for patients with pure axial spondyloarthritis in research limited uh, setup by Dr. Jyoti Nam. At the outset, let me thank the organizers for this opportunity. So I will be speaking on this controversial thing. Uh, whether NSAIDs are the only choice for patients with pure axial SBA in a resource limited setup like us. So let's see what we can do for these patients. We all know that when a patient with axial SBA walks into our OPD, we are all very vexed. We know what exactly we should do for them, but we have so many constraints especially socio-economic, that it is difficult to give them the ideal treatment that they deserve. So let's see what we can do for them. So here, uh, spondyla arthritis, angst spond and uh, non-radiographic axial SPA is what our interest is in treatment. And the prevalence, it is higher in North America, Europe and India, it's not much different. So this is what we are facing now. We have a person with axial SPA who needs biologics, but what we can offer is only NSAIDs. Is it only NSAIDs? We'll just see. I'll put forward a few of my thoughts. So first and foremost, I think we should stress on the non-pharmacological treatment for these patients. You have to educate the patients about their disease, what care they have to take, the importance of exercise, the importance of smoking cessation. And as far as exercise goes, a combination of endurance and strength training is what is recommended. And supervised exercises are better than home based and exercise generally lower cost, fewer adverse effects and overall improves your general health. So there have been 11 trials, 763 patients, home exercise was found to be better than no intervention, supervised group is better than home exercise and a combined inpatient group physio followed by an outpatient uh, group therapy is much better than a uh, uh, group physio or an outpatient basis alone. Meta-analysis is supporting the role of exercise in improving both BASDI and BASFI and active therapy is better than passive and land-based exercises are better than water-based. So exercise is something that we just cannot neglect. Now NSAIDs of course they are the first line of therapy. They are easily procurable, they are affordable and easily available and it improves pain and stiffness and in active AS a continuous treatment with NSAIDs is recommended over on-demand NSAIDs. Now, whether it results in less spinal fusion or not, that is an area of controversy. So, continuous use of NSAIDs is uh, recommended for disease act for active disease. 
and in stable, it is an on-demand NSA that is preferred. No specific NSA is recommended as that one is better than the other. You can use non-selective ones like ibuprofen or naproxen or diclofenac. Selective COX-2 inhibitors, they are costlier, but they may have some uh, role in certain areas. So the, before you change, one NS, uh, change from one NSA to the other, it is important to give a full anti-inflammatory dose for two to four weeks before you, you switch to the next. There is an efficacy in pain relief, disease activity and physical function and lower mean vasodile with 6 to 12 weeks treatment is shown in many RCTs. Now, naproxen alone can show some partial response in AS and naproxen with infliximab versus naproxen with placebo was checked for 28 weeks and even a few people uh, showed improvement in the spine in the naproxen alone group. Then two clinical trials have suggested that continuous NSAIDs result in less radiographic progression. The assays at the ULAR are very keen that the NSAID, base, NSAID that you prescribe should be based for symptomatic response alone and not based on radiographic improvement. The NSAIDs actually retarded radiological progression with continuous intake and high intake index, which means you have a chance of having higher side effects. Systematic reviews actually do not say that NSAIDs are able to pre prevent any radiological progression. Now you have to take into account the patient comorbidities. The renal functions are important in all patients where you prescribe NSAIDs. If GI side effects are more, it is preferred to go in for the COX inhibitors. And if cardiovascular disease is there, then you know that COX, how celecoxib has been thrown out of the armament area. Now, Igeratimod is an anti-inflammatory small molecule. So there was a study which, which compared placebo with Igeratimod. That is, 1 is to 2 allocation, 25 persons placebo and 48 with Igeratimod. They were assessed for 4 weeks, every 4 weeks for up to 24 weeks. There was an improvement in assess, 20 and 40. Spinal mobility, physical function and quality of life all showed <coughs> improvement. So Igeratimod is one thing which could significantly reduce symptoms and signs and improve functions and quality of life. Corticosteroids, limited role in spondyloarthritis, sacroiliac injections have shown lot of benefit. <coughs> now, 39 patients with active AS were treated with high dose of steroids, 20 mg and 50 mg and placebo for two weeks. The 50 mg group showed an improvement in the disease activity. Short term glucocorticoids can be given, but for not more than two weeks, long term systemic steroids have no role in now, there was another study, single center study, 57 patients of which 41 had a vasodilator of more than 4. They were assessed for 12 weeks, given 5 mg of oral steroid at bedtime, and they showed actually reduction in the vasodilator fatigue, pain, and stiffness. So, low dose prednisolone has shown to reduce symptoms. Sulfasalicine, meta analysis of RCTs have been checked. 11 trials, 895 patients, 2 gram to 3 grams, treated for 12 weeks to 3 years. Pooled analysis showed a significant, statistically significant reduction in the ESR and spinal stiffness. So there was a reduction in other RCTs also, pain and morning stiffness were less. One trial showed benefit in back pain chest expansion, though others did not. So sulfasalicine has showed benefit in younger patients, less than 25 years, early stages of the disease, where disease duration is less than 4 years, higher level of CRP. Uh, more than 50 at onset with a vasodilator of more than 7 and there are also other studies which have shown that higher levels of ESR at onset in younger patients also uh, sulfasalicine benefits such patients. Now the SM trial which uh, compared etanercept with sulfasalicine in the assess 20, 40 uh, and the vasodilator more than 50% of patients with sulfasalicine showed very good response. So benefit of sulfasalicine compared to placebo in axial disease was also found that benefit was there in sulfasalicin. Now methotrexate, three trials were analyzed which involved 116 patients, a 12 month trial of naproxen with methotrexate versus naproxen alone and two 24 week trials. They compared various doses of methotrexate 7.5 to 10 milligram per week to placebo for 12 to 24 weeks. Physical function, pain, spinal mobility and enthesitis were compared there was no statistically significant improvement. 
20 patients with a mean BASDA if more than 5.6 were treated with 15 mg methotrexate subcutaneously for 4 weeks followed by 20 mg per week for 12 weeks and the ASL's response was achieved only in 25% and response rate in one trial showed an, showed an improvement of about 36% in the methotrexate group compared to placebo but there is not enough evidence to support methotrexate alone in axial SPA. Now, combination of methotrexate and sulfasalazine and axial SPA, this was a landmark paper from Bellor. It was a prospective observational cohort. 150 patients were recruited, 30 were lost, 120 were assessed. Treatment with methotrexate 15 mg per week and sulfasalazine 2 grams per day combination was given over 6 months and the response was assessed after 3 and 6 months. The response, the ASA's response as well as a decrease in NSAID use and fewer patients required to switch over to biological DMARCs. So this was a very promising study which shows that combination of methotrexate and sulfasalazine are effective in managing active axial SPA patients as an alternative to biologics as evidenced by the SS20 response. Leflunamide, six month open label trials were, uh, were, uh, were looked at and 20 patients with a BASDA of more than 3, leflunamide was given initially for 3 days in a 100 mg per day dose, followed by 20 mg per day for 6 months. 10 out of 20 did not uh, complete the study because of side effects. Leflunamide was effective in 25% and reached the primary outcome of 25% improvement in BASDA. But it does not improve spinal symptoms but may benefit peripheral arthritis. Cyclosporine calcineurin inhibitor has shown promise in peripheral disease and uh, in psoriasis but no role in axial SPA. Bisphosphonates, anti-osteoclastic and anti-inflammatory agents, they inhibit the cytokine production by macrophages. In RCT, double blinded, 84 patients were compared, 60 received 60 mg uh, per month for 6 months or 10 mg per month for 6 months. So these two groups of patients were compared. End of six months, improvement was seen in the BASDAI, BAS3 and the ESR, CRP in the 60 milligram group, which was very significant. So 35 patients of Angspond enrolled 26 received all the six infusions. At six months, mean BASDAI decreased by 56.4 and also the other markers were significantly less. 22 out of 26 achieved the SS20 and 20 out of 26 achieved the BASDAI. 50 response. So pulsed parmidronate therapy, 60 mg per month for 6 months, reduction in axial and peripheral joint symptoms and quantified by the BASDAI, BASP, BASME, CRP and the ESR. So early symptomatic relief was there but only the side effects were very mild, post infusion myalgia, arthralgia and fever was, right up, was uh, reported. Thalidomide can inhibit TNF alpha now and it can increase uh, the IL-4 at the 5. So, 6 month open label trial, trial where 13 men with spondyl arthritis on a background of a fixed dose NSAID and DMARD for at least 3 months were given, were tried 100 mg thalidomide daily for 1 week followed by 100 mg BD for 23 weeks. So, total 24 weeks. Vasdai, Vasfi, secondary outcomes like CRP, ESR recorded at baseline and weeks 2, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20 and 24, 3 withdrew due to side effects, 2 were lost to follow up, 8 completed the course and 4 experienced more than 40% improvement while 4 experienced 20 to 40% improvement. There were 2 more uncontrolled trials, 2 patients who had dramatic improvement, 12 patients of which 7 showed an improvement at 200 mg per day of thalidomide. So thalidomide given its side effects and if the patient is suitable for taking thalidomide, it's very effective for axial and peripheral arthritis persistent to other treatment. Now targeted synthetic DMARDs, non-biologic small molecules, eprimilast which inhibits the phosphodiesterase, suppresses the pro-inflammatory cytokines, increases the anti-inflammatory mediators, 36 patients treated with eprimilast or placebo for 12 weeks, moderate reduction in the BASDAI which was not statistically significant. JAK inhibitors, the new molecules which are showing a lot of promise. So we know that several cytokines, interleukin 23, 17, acts as signal through the JAK family. Now several studies of JAK inhibitors in active ankylosing spondylitis patients 
who had inadequate response or intolerance to two or more NSAIDs. Three RCTs were selected, 406 patients, Jack Upa, Upadacitinib 15 mg per day, Filgotinib 200 mg per day or Tofa 5 mg per day. Uh, 5 mg BD per day. They assessed 20, 40 and uh, were significantly higher improvement in the JAK group. So, JAK inhibitors decrease disease activity and can be used as a potential therapeutic, therapeutic alternative in ANSPON. So, see, at the end of this, we are here. Maybe India will become less of a resource limited country or the cost of biologics may come down, patient may afford this more. But in the meantime, what we have is hope. Things are not so bad. We have a few more drugs which the patient can afford, which we can give to alleviate their symptoms. So till that time, when everything is perfect, we can only take the middle path. Thank you. So over to Dr. Molly for the time. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti, for the wonderful presentation. In fact, we gave an overview of all the possibilities that we have in the management of patients having pure angst form uh, to those who cannot afford uh, biological agents. Uh, as we all know that now, for most of us, I think Jyoti also has only told that when a patient walks into the clinic, when we see pure angst form, we always think of TNF inhibitors first. But most of our patients, especially in government setup, cannot afford the treatment. Hardly 4% of our population have it access to health insurance. Most government-based health insurance do not support infliximab and TNF inhibitors. So our hands are really tight and some of some patients can uh, afford to, you know, arrange finances for six months. But beyond that, most of us cannot, uh, most of our patients cannot afford. So just to give a quick summary in two slides, two minutes, I will just tell you about the benefits of NSAIDs. It is clearly proven that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory they improve inflammation, function, disease activity, and pain. And it has been seen that the earlier the disease, the better is the response. And you can choose any type of NSAIDs. Basically, no difference in efficacy has been found between various non-selective, non-steroidal. Also, no difference actually in efficacy between non-selective versus coccyx. And in the a... Side is not coming. It is there, sir. This one? Yes. 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 Yes, I'm just going to the fourth point now. No difference in efficacy has been seen between non-selective versus coccyx. So you can choose any actually based on the patient preference. You know, some patients prefer this or versus that. And it depends on the cost also. Also, one particular trial did show that continuous NSAIDs for two years may reduce radiographic progression, particularly where CRP is high. So we do have evidence of the efficacy of non-steroidal, but the disadvantages are plenty. Many, many patients are worried. They will not even want to take for one month also because they say, what will happen to my kidney? What will may happen to the creatinine? What will happen to me? Will I develop CKD? And you know, uh, many issues are there. And beyond a certain amount of time, I think we also are not comfortable to give NSAIDs for a pretty long amount of time. So I think we, have, we yet cannot give up with sulfazalazine and methotrexate. If you look at the two Cochrane reviews, which has, uh, which has uh, summarized the effect of sulfasalazine, this is the second line. It, the conclusion was that further studies with larger sample sizes, longer duration and using validated outcome measures are needed to verify the uncertainty of sulfasalazine in angstpon. Of particular interest is that the SN trial, which had compared head-to-head etanercept -head versus sulfasalazine, the major criticism of this study was that the assessment period was very short, that is six weeks. So really, sulfasalazine does not work. It takes as much as longer than six weeks to work, actually. So when the trial was, uh, endpoint was six weeks, so really we cannot give up on sulfasalazine yet. And Indian data has clearly shown uncontrolled observation studies from Velo of the combi, like Jyoti already has said, that the... ASAS 20 response of 6 months was comparable in those who had arthritis versus who do not. And one more option is TNF inhibitor for 6 months to consolidate the therapy which is followed by combination of sulfasalazine and methotrexate. A very interesting data came from Dr. Shifali in PGI where she has clearly shown that sulfasalazine in patients with pure angstpon, the change of ASAS was more in sulfasalazine when compared to placebo. So there is still hope and we can still use these drugs. 
what I would like to say is that even in our center, we do give TNF inhibitors for many patients at the beginning till six months or so, and then we follow it up by sulfasalazine and methotrexate, which is a practical experience. So finally, the consensus I would say is that NSAIDs are not the only choice in pure NSPON in resource constrained settings, that is in people who cannot afford TNF inhibitors. Though strong evidence of JAK inhibitors is emerging, I feel that sulfazilazine and or methotrexate must be tried as they have a proven record of safety and the long term safety of JAK inhibitors is not established yet. So maybe we need to generate more data on the role of cortico of conventional synthetic demands in form, and we also need probably RCTs because most of the RCTs on physical therapy, exercise, weight training, etc. which has shown clear benefit to improve function and pain needs further assessment in our country. Thank you so much. Uh, we would like to invite questions and answers for all the, for all the talk. Dr. Abro on the radiographic for the grand round case and Dr. Jyoti Parida for the molecular signature. Questions are invited. No questions. So I think it's very clear, no questions. Maybe I have one question for Jyoti, Jyoti Parida. <laughs> Uh, in your study, which is very interesting, you know, that the, in, in Oxford, you came this in 2021, <coughs> how many patients had evidence of infection in uh, the act of... There are around 40 patients who have taken as a history, with the history of infection. Okay. And 60 okay. are not having any infection, who are actually only the patients. Okay. So without infection, we have found them at all. Under the infection. Under the infection. And uh, anybody had psychoinfectus? Oh, there are many. Uh, I think uh, that exact data I don't have uh, right now, but I think some 20% to 20% have psychoinfectus because there are variable uh, uh, duration of treatment actually. Okay. So many of them, particularly US peer group, I think there are many having psychoinfectus. Because I believe you give Lumenex, Mosinex, Asiomex, Cytokines, with the some of them could be used in the clinics too, which are promising. Yes. No, I think that they have to, uh, they are not still yet formalized. I think there are very little research has been done in reactive arthritis okay. most. And, but we see so many patients in our daily clinic. Yeah. I think all of us. Uh, but still we yeah. depend on Western data to tell us that which are important and which are not yes, And even this microbiota data I have shown you, that's only one report from Guet Mala. Okay. So I think that those kind of studies will have more help. <coughs> and like I have told you, the cytokine is not very fixed at one uh, point of time. Like your acute arthritis, acute synovitis, you have a different profile of cytokines. But you know, one thing is very clear that TNF actually comes a little late actually. Okay. The TNF cytokine, usually that is seen in the chronic phase of the disease. <coughs> so maybe in very acute uh, reactive arthritis, uh, whether this anti-TNF is uh, that much effective or not. Because IL-17 is more important in the early phase. Uh, TNF is uh, late when the patient goes to chronic SPI and this thing. So those things have to be sorted out I think more studies are required to address those questions. Then only the clinical uh, translation uh, can happen and treatment can be decided. Yes, sir. Vasil, please. Yes, sir, I'm Apneesh from CMC. Sir, uh, there is data on some long-term long antibiotic in chlamydia specifically only. Uh, so, in your clinical practice, is there any cases that you use antibiotics? One. And two, uh, yeah, do we have, uh, because we don't test for uh, specific anti, uh, any SMSP infection, should we do uh, any antibiotic therapy in any of them? What is your? I think that antibiotic therapy is also controversial because by the yeah. time the patient is reaching us already, that uh, infection is over. And second is chlamydia, particularly chlamydia infection is not that common in our country. And that is only uh, prescribed for the chlamydia post reactive arthritis because still people believe that there is some uh, persistent form of the bacteria maybe lying in the uh, this thing in the joint which is exciting this uh, or perpetuating this immune response. So I don't use uh, particularly if the patient has no urine infection or uh, there is no fossil in this thing. We don't treat with antibiotics. Jyoti, is there any role of reform piece in? That antibiotic, uh, when people used to uh, treat for uh, with antibiotic, at that time, rifampicin was used, azithromycin, doxycycline, 
republication. But nowadays, uh, because we actually see more of enteric bacteria related thing, and uh, maybe most of these microorganisms uh, that we see at your arthritis are not exploited yet, that we don't know what organisms are actually causing it. Sexual transmitted diseases, chlamydia, I think that is very, very less in our country and hardly we find pa patient comes to the history of dyslexia or uh, comes to the history of urethral discharge or something. Mostly it's GI. It's mostly GI. So most of the works by Dr. Misra and his group on salmonella. There's not on chlamydia from SDPJ group, whatever the, uh, this thing they have done, mostly on salmonella. If there are no further questions or comments, I think we'll close the session. We'll invite the next team to come over. Thank you very much. I thank my co-chair and all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you.